Okay, so we're going to begin our investigations into Thomas Hobbes' thought by today kind of um, investigating a, a really foundational concept uh, in his oeuvre, something very important to understanding uh, Hobbes' political doctrine from any angle. And this is the concept of fear. So we're going to be unpacking this concept as it relates to Hobbes' understanding of the state of nature on the one hand and the foundations of sovereignty on the other. So let's just kind of um, jump right in. Okay, so for Thomas Hobbes, fear is endemic to the human condition. The intention of his masterwork, The Leviathan, is to elucidate a doctrine of absolute sovereignty grounded in the scientific method and the universal human fear of death. Unpacking the political implications of this requires a sustained analysis of Hobbes' theory of how the state of nature relates to the social contract. In political terms, the problem Hobbes' theory of the state of nature poses might be reduced to this question. How to forge stability amidst creatures equal in power and prone to conflict? The standards that dominate the nature of our political institutions, according to Hobbes, ought to be derived from the nature of man himself. But getting to the essential qualities of man requires an analysis of his, quote, naked state, unquote. Nature, rather than promoting the model of goodness towards which human well-being strives, is, according to Hobbes, an abyss of terrors and fears to be assuaged and protected, uh, to be protected from. Also, in contrast to some, someone like Aristotle's commitment to taxonomize different regimes and citizenries, Hobbes is concerned with producing a universal model of sovereign politics applicable, as he says, to, quote, all men in all places and at all times, end quote. Contrary to Locke, the sociability of man does not preempt the development of the state. Hobbes's state of nature is characterized by violence, brutality, and pride, with the state being a spontaneous creation and a denaturalized artificiality. But there is still equality in the state of nature inequality being held as a product of convention. And this equality stands as a problem for Hobbes. For in Hobbes' state of nature, the lack of a sovereign body means that each man must judge what is best for his own self-preservation. To this end, every man has a right to everything. And, the, and this most basic equality is simply the power of men to kill one, one another when conflict arises. And conflicts always arise. Since men naturally seek out ways to fulfill desires, power becomes the main coin in the state of nature's economy. Power for Hobbes is the present means an individual has in order to, quote, obtain some future apparent good, end quote. There is a direct instrumentality to this understanding of power. Given the influence of the natural sciences upon Hobbes' aims, as well as his mechanistic approach to the study of politics, power operates within Hobbes' theory as something that has a physicality to it. It may be collectivized and stored up, pooled like latent energy in a machine. This will become important as we unpack his definition of the sovereign. But before we can do this, we must conclude our analysis, analysis of the state of nature. Since power is equally distributed in the state of nature, the strong, for instance, do not have precedent, as the weak may bound together and overpower the strong, just through sheer numbers, quote, from this equality of ability arises the equality of hope in the attaining of our ends. And therefore, if any two men desire the same thing, which nevertheless they cannot both enjoy, they become enemies, end quote. Since, according to Hobbes, there exists no power to overawe anyone in the state of nature, individuals in the state of nature suffer from competition, mistrust, and attempts at glory, transforming the state of nature into a state of war and chaos. 
Glory in particular concerns one's reputation and is thus associated with pride. For Hobbes, justice is a convention of language, and a sovereign is required to set definitions in the adjudication of conflicts. As Hobbes, as Hobbes argues, quote, where there is no common power, there is no law. Where no law, no injustice. Justice, he observes, is the fulfilling of one's covenants, and without a sovereign body to ensure the parties involved in covenants maintain their mutual responsibility, covenants dissolve. There is, then, no justice in the state of nature. So while conflicts arise, the only available recourse is to the power at hand, shrouded as it is by the fear of death. To this end, fear of one's personal death is always imminent, and it is precisely this fear men seek to abandon in the establishment of sociality and sovereignty. The sovereign offers this to, to its subjects, security, order, and protection. It is under this auspice that Hobbes defines sovereignty as, quote, one person of whose acts a great multitude by mutual covenants with one another have made themselves every one the author. To the end, he may use the strength and means of them all as he shall think expedient for their peace and common defense, end quote. Individuals spontaneously collectivize in the hopes of narrowing the omnipresence of fear, authorizing a group or individual to exercise absolute power for the security of the community. And here for Hobbes, a group or a person can inhabit that office. Fear of one's own death and the desire for this security propel man out of the state of nature and into civic cohabitation. For Hobbes, while the state of nature is characterized by violence, there is still reason, and it is the faculty of this reason that define the rules for sovereignty's peaceful order. Reason thus outlines the rights or freedoms and laws or obligations of nature. The most fundamental right being, quote, the preservation of one's own nature, end quote. And the most fundamental law, according to Hobbes, derivable from this being the actual commitment to this preservation. But where these laws bind the reasoned elements of man, men's minds, it is fear, being the most powerful of men's passions, which equally motivates, or which actually motivates. The sovereign thus becomes the visible manifestation of collective power. It is authorized to overawe subjects into submission, not eliminating fear, but transferring it from the state of nature and transforming it. The sovereign stabilizes fear by way of legitimately exercising its first right, which is the wielding of police power. The sovereign, according to Hobbes, is thus authorized to place obligations upon subjects namely their fulfillment of established governments, and to punish those who fail to abide. Behind this stands the principle that obligations only truly bind when fear is the primary motivation. When an individual transgresses, it is a prideful assertion of self-interest, destructive to political stability. To act against a covenant is to act upon a right one has otherwise transferred or relinquished. It is this fear of punishment that the individual's calculating pride weighs against the costs of transgression. We might say that while mutual consent contributes legit legitimacy to the sovereign's authority, it is fear which actually enables the sovereign to govern and ensure safety. In an effort to realize security and by dint of the social contract, each individual mutually obliges himself or herself to lay down certain rights. But these rights are transferred, and the social contract only binding when order is actually preserved. What this implies is that the political world is in constant threat of civil war and collapse. Vigilance is required against corruption and undoing. This points to a basic inalienable right and the basis of Hobbes' incorporation into the liberal tradition. 
There is no form of contract or covenant that may deny an individual their own pursuit of interested self-preservation. Related to this is Hobbes' definition of freedom as the, quote, absence of opposition, end quote. Where the law is silent, subjects may assert their self-interests as they see fit. Liberty is quite literally described in terms of the lack of physical hindrances, again with the implication being that the power the sovereign retains is a power to repress and otherwise physically deny. The implications of Hobbes' theory for liberal politics are profound. Firstly, Hobbes, in contrast to his ancient predecessors like Plato, developed a model of sovereign legitimacy, legitimacy that takes seriously the notion that to make men just, all that is required is the calculation of self-interest and the cost analyses of benefits versus punishments. In this way, self-interest can be said to form the basis of Hobbes' entire notion of justice and his notion of the police state. This self-interest is not incompatible with the absolute dictates of the sovereign, but since it authorizes the sovereign in the first place, is in fact represented by and within the sovereign's commands. In other words, fear and liberty, peace and subjection are not incompatible, but mutually reinforcing and theoretically consistent. If freedom only exists under a sovereign power that retains a monopoly over fear, then it is rational for a subject to submit. Fear, according to Hobbes, enables justice. That concludes our basic investigation into Hobbes' account of fear. I hope that this forms part of a foundation to explore some of Hobbes' more complex ideas, as well as a contribution to our, our ongoing analysis of the theoretical foundations of modern propaganda. I hope you all got something out of our uh, talk today. Thank you, and take care.